Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Like Mansi said, I think hopefully this panel is going to wake everyone up. So uh, kudos to the organizers for uh, placing it optimally on the agenda. Um, so the title of this panel is The Future of AI, Big Tech, or Open Source Technology. Um, I think we can all agree that artificial intelligence is a very transformative technology. The potential in a country like India is huge. Uh, the harms are also pretty significant. The risks are also pretty significant. Um, and so this panel is really a space for us to interrogate what that future looks like for in the Indian context. Um, just to set some context, so while we have seen huge strides in AI over the past decade or so, I think we also need to recognize that those strides in AI have happened alongside the growth of big tech power. Uh, machine learning is not a new technology. It's not a new computational technique. What's new is the availability of data and the availability of the computational infrastructure to be able to process that data. And big tech companies have had a business model which many have called one of surveillance capitalism that has allowed them a con continuous flow of that data and also allowed them to attract the talent, to build the infrastructure that they need to be able to dominate the AI race. So I think we need to look at the big tech and AI question quite closely. They're not separate phenomenon. Um, so the question then is that what does the future of AI look like? Can we imagine a future of AI which is more democratic, in which we have a more democ democratized AI innovation ecosystem that is not only led by big tech companies? Um, I think in recent years, one of the uh, a movement or an idea that has gained a lot of momentum is that open source could be a way to challenge the dominance of big tech and to create a more equitable inclusive, democratic AI innovation ecosystem. Uh, and I think there's tremendous value in that argument. I think uh, open source has the potential to, to enable a, a larger kind of community of innovators to participate. But I think we also need to open, approach the open source question with a grain of salt. Uh, most of the internet is actually based on open source, open source technology. The growth of big tech is also based on the, on the back of open source technology. And open source in itself does not guarantee oversight. Open, open source in itself does not guarantee accountability. Neither does open source in itself actually guarantee a community of innovators. Uh, if you look at the open source community today, which does most of the heavy lifting of, of our internet infrastructure, it's actually a very concentrated community. There's a very few number of open source providers who provide the backbone of our internet infrastructure. So we need to be cautious in how we frame this debate um, and I think cut through some of the noise around big tech, open source, and also not frame these as binaries. Um, so I could not ask for a more uh, exceptional and uh, uh, animated panel to have this conversation with. Uh, Pramod, I'm gonna start with you, if that's okay. Um, so I, I, I know that you are very optimistic about the future of AI in India, uh, and you think that there's a lot of potential, a lot of transformative potential. Uh, there's also a lot of noise around what AI can do. So I was hoping you could start with helping us cut through the noise and pinpoint where exactly you see this potential. And in this in this vision of the future of AI in India, what role does big tech play? Sure. Uh, very happily. Thank you. Pleasure to be here on this panel. Uh, it'll be noisy, I promise you, this panel. Uh, that's one thing I can guarantee, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so let me just start with... Um, with the fundamental premise that I have that AI is a technology which is one very different from other types of technology that have come in the past. Uh, and as we think about its risks and dangers, we must recognize that because the very nature of the technology is such that it's fluid, it can be accessible by many, most people can get to it, lots of startups are working on it, lots of people are on it. So therefore it's going to, diffuse across the country, across innovation, and across companies very quickly as it's doing already. Two, I think we must differentiate this notion of the, uh, big tech between those who lived off surveillance capital and others who have nothing to do with surveillance capital, Microsoft. Uh, they don't live off surveillance capital. They never have, right? They built cloud products, they build other products, which companies use. There's, that's the main thing, and that's how they grow. And they, they're still growing. 
the others are obviously google meta insta etc etc uh, x do grow through that so i do want to differentiate as to who's using big tech how certainly apple is considered big tech and doesn't use this and it's been remarkable although it uses enough other techniques to hold you uh, to the ground but you know that's our choice to be honest i think i think of it as a consumer it's up to me to get off it or not off it it's entirely my choice and the fact that i'm on it i can't i, I find it hard to blame somebody else for it uh, at the ground level though she and this is a long standing issue we have no way of measuring or talking about what's really happening on the ground in terms of startups and who's using ai where is it being applied how is it working all of this will necessarily happen after the event so actually we don't have a clue on this stuff so when we say it's dominated by big tech etc etc it's nonsense we don't know because we don't have any way of measuring what's happening on the ground all i can tell you from my limited vantage point as an investor and as someone who works with many startups is that the scale of progress of these startups is incredible the number of people investing in them is huge sadly for india well i'm not sure it's sad or not but perhaps it shouldn't matter 90% of all investments in venture capital are global are us it's not indian companies but you know again i don't want to blame them i mean i want to blame the the guys in india why aren't we investing why aren't indian tech companies investing like mad here why aren't just like google has done there why we have the choice we we're not doing it that's entirely up to us and yet what we are finding is that companies are solving for a zillion different things let me give you a few examples health tech the ability to use ai to produce health tech assistance which can provide healthcare to india bharat whatever you call it across the country you could you are never going to achieve that by adding doctors and nurses it ain't going to happen because you need too many doctors and you need too many nurses and that will get to them 10 15 years later this technology using ai etc can allow you to train healthcare assistants i work with a couple of ngos that do that i work with a tech company that does that it's allowing them to reach places mountains where no cycle can go no scooter can go and they're providing health tech services to those people connecting it to doctors getting them services in a way you could not imagine earlier education the way we can use ai let tools to educate not all of them but actually help the person who is perhaps the poorest in the class to get upgraded to the best because you can now do what is an odd phrase mass customization you can really measure everyone's progress on education and classes financial inclusion we desperately need ai in financial inclusion even though we all talk about financial inclusion in india making huge progress and it has the fact is india remains the large the largest underbanked economy in the world why lack of records lack of cash lack of understanding of habits lack, lack of formal um salary slips lack of information so people like us we are i run a finance company as well i don't run it i'm a founder we don't lend to them because we don't have data now fortunately at least i can apply all kinds of other tools techniques etc with their permission to allow me to get a view on how i can include them in the credit net lending to new to credit is the holy grail while we focus on inclusivity of all the others that is a holy grail and that's where we need more msmes 30% of msmes have borrowings in india 30% this is a, it, and this is where i think the magic and promise of ai is fantastic last one is i absolutely appreciate we need regulation we need good regulation we need to make sure it doesn't get spoiled we need to make sure too many risks aren't taken we need to be damn certain we don't throw the baby out of with the bath water because the 
noise is all around. Oh my God, this is going to kill us. Oh my God, look what's going to happen. Oh my God, look what's going to happen with it. Of course, of course it is. It's like in lending, you know, everybody says, oh my God, we're going to get bad loans. Oh, what a surprise. Oh my God, in startups, nine out of 10 are going to fail. Oh, how terrible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have a follow-up question for you. I mean, I think this whole narrative that AI is going to kill us is actually coming from the tech companies themselves as a way for them to avoid more stringent regulation. But that's that's a, maybe a separate conversation. But the question that I want to ask you is on the startups, on healthcare and education. So in many, I mean, we the data issue is often acknowledged, right? That we don't have enough local da localized data for healthcare, for education, and we need to build more localized data sets. And we see a lot of policy attention on this data question. The question that I think doesn't get enough attention, and you'd be well-placed to answer that perhaps, is the revenue model for these startups. What is the business case for an AI for social good startup? Many of the startups that I interact with who are working in the AI for social good space struggle. Like, who is the end customer when you're building diagnostics for rural India, when you're building uh, education solutions for rural India. So is there a good enough revenue model for this startup ecosystem to grow in the AI for social good space? It, like all of these things, these will develop. They, you, these are not cookie cut answers that you will have now. These will develop and it will develop through innovation and creativity. There's enough people out there saying exactly the question you have. When I'm an investor, I'm sitting there and saying, what is your revenue model? Show me how you're going to make money. You're only going to be able to charge 400 rupees, 300 rupees for this. How are you going to make money? And these people are working on that. And they will come up with their revenue models or they'll go to other places. Or we go to the government and say, okay, government, if you want to introduce public health in a way that is accessible to more, here are a bunch of models which can sit on top of your digital public infrastructure. And here's another way to use it. So I think these will evolve. These will happen over time. But certainly I can tell you, um, pretty much you should see Sanjeev, he was here earlier, myself, um, Peak 15, many other companies. We are intensely focused on AI because the data sets also, large LLMs need to quote Shakespeare and solve for biorhythms. Narrow data sets, which is what these products are based out of, can, become, can come from 15 hospitals. And that's why this technology will not be dominated by big tech because everybody can use it. It's not that expensive. I've funded a mental health uh, startup, $1 million. They've got pretty much mental health backed. So the, the ability to do that is unprecedented. That's why, I mean, this technology is different from what we've seen in the past. Not to not to give you not to uh, have just a bilateral conversation. That's all. Come back to this. But Venki, maybe I can bring you in. Sorry that you couldn't be here uh, to join us. Um, so maybe picking up on what Pramod was saying, right? Um, how would we democratize the, the AI innovation ecosystem? And can we try and think of, think about that across the tech stack? So I think Pramod alluded to the data point, but can we think about it even one layer further up? Maybe we think about it at the infrastructure layer, at the cloud layer. Uh, what would it take to democratize it? And, you know, speaking to, I know, an issue that is very close to your heart, what role does open source have to play in this? Thanks, Urvashi. And, uh, you know, thanks for that question because uh, open source is, of course, very close to my heart. Uh, you know, typically, if you look at it, uh, the AI tech stack consists of compute, it consists of the models, the training data, and the services. I think we have we'll do extremely well in services because of the natural advantages that we have, the amount of trained manpower that we have. And I think Pramod uh, alluded to that. Uh, but I think we are way behind in the hardware side. We are uh, way behind on the you know models. And these are, you know, we have to realize that these are, you know, decadal efforts that have, you know, currently come to fruition. I think the epochal moment that we see with open AI is the result of almost 50 to 60 years of research in universities, in MIT and uh, and other universities across the world. So I think it will take us a really long time. What we can do to play catch up is the fact that on the compute side, if you look at uh, what's happening currently, the risk v computing instruction set, that's the one that's you know gathering the lot of action. Uh, large companies are looking at leveraging that to build their own chips for you know for uh, the large computing infrastructure 
And a little known fact is that India was actually one of the pioneers participating in the Risk by Consortium. IIT Madras is one of the founding members of the Risk by Consortium. So 60% uh, of that is basically software and uh, primarily open source software. We cannot play the proprietary technology game because it will take us decades to catch up there. So we have to look at investing heavily in the Risk by Consortium and uh, building those open source technologies at the hardware level. Uh, on the model side, there are companies like Sarvam AI, et cetera, which are coming up. My guesstimate is that it will take them about four or five years from a standing start to you know really achieve a certain level of scale. Uh, on the data set side, it's good to see that the government of India has come up with initiatives like Bashini, uh, which is a system for creating Indian language content. And <clears throat> I think this has been an extremely neglected area because Indian language content, uh, I mean, most Indians do not speak English, you know, and most of the content in India is in English. I remember FC Kohli was one of the founding fathers of the uh, of the internet and of the IT industry, saying that, you know, we should invest heavily in creating Indian language content so that people in India can benefit. So initiatives like Bashani, which are creating Indian language training sets are also really, really important. And uh, finally, I think, you know, we should leverage open source LLMs heavily because the geopolitics of technology is such that, you know, we don't know when there will be a denial of technology regime. So maybe at this point in time, we are using uh, proprietary LLMs to create our models, to create, you know, uh, our uh, services. But I think eventually we should, you know, move to more uh, open source LLMs from a long-term de-risking perspective. So let me stop there. I think uh, if there are follow-up questions, I'm happy to take that. Maybe just on the last point, Menki, I think on the point around open source LLMs, I mean, this is a very alive discussion in places like the EU when the EU AI Act was being negotiated um, on what are the risks of open source? Should we be regulating these open source LLMs? Is it too early? So any, do you have any concerns about the having open source LLMs, is there anything that we need to be cautious about so we build in the adequate guardrails early on? See, ultimately, if you look at the software, that is just one layer of the overall stack. You know, if you look at what it takes to build something and deliver it to the people. Uh, so I would say there needs to be open source at three layers. One is at the level of technology building, uh, open source at the level of you know building a community of practice, so can we bring multiple stakeholders together? Can we build, can we bring, you know, people who are the most affected by these technologies onto the table? Uh, so that's, and the third layer is basically the community of governance. Again, you know, can we kind of create a community where we bring everybody together to think through the impact of these technologies on society? You know, how do we bring in innovation while, you know, also keeping checks and balances in place? Can we build some of those checks and balances into the very architecture of the technology itself? So I think these are the questions that we need to look at. And uh, open source is a means to an end. It's an it's a important component, but you need governance. You need the community of practice to you know, really be able to build a solution that benefits society and uh, you know, builds in some checks and balances. Thanks, thank you. I just want to come back to you actually for more than one point that uh, Venki raised. So in the startups that you work with, that you're advising, is there a appetite for open source or are they concerned about what the commercial implications might be? No, there is an appetite for open source, absolutely. Many of them rely on it. That's how they grow. That's why it's it's working for them. Frankly, if they had to go some other route, they may not work. It may not, uh, it may not happen. It's that important. In, and that's why, again, it's also that important for the future, to allow competitiveness, to allow innovation to happen, I think that has to be an essential part. Otherwise, I think we would be in trouble. Thank you. Well, to come to you, uh, I think very often we think of regulation and innovation, or incorrectly think of regulation and innovation as being a, as two opposite ends, right? That if you have too much regulation, it will get in the way of innovation. We need to have less regulation for innovation. But I know that's not something that, that's not a notion that you subscribe to. Um, so in your in your kind of perspective, do you think AI companies have the potential in India to be competitors of big tech or will they be 
kind of subsumed or subsumed into the kind of big tech ecosystem and what role then does regulation have to play in enabling that innovation ecosystem thanks urushi and thanks for your uh, opening remarks so just uh, to <clears throat> contextualize where I'm coming from till very recently, I was with the competition regulator. And so could be my hobby horse. So competition and innovation competition is something which we were thinking very, very uh, deeply on issues and also facing uh, uh, and dealing with lots of cases which came before the competition authority. And that was in the mobile ecosystem. So so last time I was there in such, uh, in such a situation, answering these kinds of questions was that when there was a huge change wrought by technology with the onset of Web 2.0 in the mid uh, 2000s. Uh, so the only thing at, at this moment when I am thinking about regulation in the context of AI is to, is to not to repeat a mistake which the regulators did all over the world was to caught, uh, they were caught actually sleeping on the wheel. Uh, because by the time the mobile ecosystems and by the time uh, the services were by the platformization of technologies happened, there were free services monetized through extensive, I won't use the word surveillance, but extent, extensive data extraction, huge amount of uh, data extraction and creating private property rights on data which did not belong to these companies. So, uh, that was their business model. And we had, a, as a result, um, extra essential services which were conditioned to the widespread hoarding and uh, collection of this data. So this created large companies, this created the quote in quote, quote, big tech now and not big tech. They became big tech because of the fact that they, they were able to extract huge amounts of data and there was some kind of a data hegemony. And, and as we say, then rest is history when it came to competition. The only fear, and I will not also sound very alarmist, I am also, uh, and in fact, I've had so many discussions with Pramod in the pre-run to this session that I am, uh, I, I, am I think we have a middle, middle path, path with both of us, uh, I think, agreed upon. We are not talking about regulate, stifling regulation. We are not talking about regulation that would that would uh, kill innovation, and we are not talking about uh, uh, a regulation which is uninformed or is does not know understand the technology. So that, of course, is 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 no one's case. But having said that, if there is a disruptive technology, do we need to repeat the mistakes of the past? Do we need to now have the kind of knee jerk reactions which Europe has now had? when it comes to regulating uh, uh, technology with coming out very, very uh, intrusive uh, Digital Markets Act? Or should we then just take a step backwards, understand, learn from the past mistakes, and it, regulation would then be uh, managing relationships between the providers of the fundamental technology. And, and I also agree India need not, India means we, India can continue with its efforts. India need not replicate or get into the technology uh, which it can get off the shelf due to tremendous amount of investment, tremendous amount of intellectual capital, which was a, a, available from global, global companies. So please, we should be uh, taking that uh, 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 global intellectual capital, using that global intellectual capital in the as an economist, as in the comparative advantage we have that is working in the application layer. So that is the startups. And Pramod has pointed out India is, will, has done immensely well when it came to applications in the uh, mobile ecosystem. And India will do immensely well uh, when it comes to the AI uh, applications. Now, what needs to be done and the nuanced and the very finessed regulations such that the relationship between the big tech and and the uh, uh, application layer is 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 far more on equal terms such that they don't are in a situation of unequal bargaining power because of the foundation model because of the training data sets because of the compute powers because of the cpus and gpus uh, because of the open source uh, uh, allowing uh, companies to uh, uh, who are giving a model as a service allowing companies to, again, usurp a lot of data from these users, and then 
use that data to compete against those very startups whom they were giving this technology as an open source. The Android open source project, we know what happened with that. It started as an open source, uh, uh, but it closed down through its licensing agreements. The MADAs of the world, the AFS of the world made sure that the entire data sets can be therefore rep stay repositories with only those big techs. So uh, the um, bundling, a classic problem with these open source models which happened was that bundling of Google search with the Android opening system, uh, operating system resulted in flow of data to Google. So the idea is regulate, don't let regulate nimbly, don't let the mistakes of the past happen Open source, yes, but make sure that open source where you are using model as a surface does not lead to a data advantage of through data feedback loops, which happened in the mobile ec ecosystem back to the big tech so that they have a, a situation of an unequal bargaining power and, and, and the startups are now knocking doors of civil courts for certain problems. Um, thanks. I mean, there's a couple of there's a bunch of things I think that are layered in in what your comment in in your comments. Um, there was a point around kind of data sharing and being able to have more equitable data arrangements. I think there was a point around kind of bundling, and I think what you're alluding to is there also the kind the need for more well deliberated kind of competition policy. So when you say regulation and regulate nimbly, what is the kind of regulation that you think is needed? So that there are two two sets. Competition law actually is a is a very very narrow instrument. I must say it it is not a solution to the problems of creating a more democratized uh, ecosystem where uh, the participants with different comparative advantages. So it is not about horizontal camp competition. It is not about how our startups can bring the next best foundational model or how our startups can uh, create the next best cloud. Uh, it is about how as I said, the relationship is governed uh, and, and competition law could do it only on a case by case basis. All right. So that becomes a very, very arduous, slow process to correct markets and to provide some succor to the people who are dependent on these technologies. So dependencies will, inc will exist. There will be huge amount of dependencies uh, of our startup ecosystem on these big techs. Dependencies are not bad. I'm with Sanjeev uh, uh, Bikchandani that we don't need to create the next Google. We don't need to create the next Lama and we don't need to be the next Anthropic. So it's or, or, or open, no, open AI. It may happen. It should happen. Efforts are there, but it may take slowly. So what India should be doing, policy instruments and those policy and regulatory instruments are regarding data. So we already have started. DP, DP is there. will take time for the rules to come out, how uh, 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 the data hegemony can be diluted a little bit such that there is no unfair advantage to certain, uh, uh, certain uh, data fiduciaries and principals have control over their data. Uh, second would be the some policy on non-personal data. So we did there was a discussion that, that there should be two instruments. One should be on personal data and one should be on non-personal data. I think that's one area which I think the governance architecture should be uh, looking into. Uh, then comes prevention of anti-competitive practices. So prevention of anti-competitive practices clearly lies in the domain of the competition regulator. So that's an ex-post activity. The ex-ante activity which competition authorities did not do and now have raised, have, have acted quickly for instance, the FTC has opened investigations uh, against five companies, or at least has asked them to let us know what your agreements are with, say, OpenAI, Microsoft's agreement with OpenAI, uh, then um, uh, Google's with Anthropic, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and so they want to understand those agreements. Once that investigation got opened up, the website of uh, OpenAI said that where Microsoft is an important investor, the next day, the website changed and said Microsoft has some economic interests in open air. Uh, so they have been able to dodge the uh, merger regimes because the merger regimes do look at the kind of agreements and the relationships which, uh, say, these big tech had with these uh, new flourishing uh, technology companies in the space. So you don't want that. And that's what's, uh, what one, one of my uh, points is. You don't want a new flourishing ecosystem 
with the possibility of disruption and with the possibility of, uh, possibility of dislodging to be absorbed again in an in the same ecosystem which was created when uh, in web 2.0 so that's my i think my uh, 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 br uh, brief point and and for that i think the regulators are in fact squarely to be blamed the the companies did what was in the commercial interest the companies responded to the commercial interest of their investors of of and gave my right benefits to consumers but the regulators could not anticipate that how how would this technology develop the role of the regulators is not to not to kill technology not to kill innovation and it, therefore there is not a it's not a binary that if there's regulation there would be some problem it it, it 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 could thrive innovation it could increase innovation but the role is to see the direction of technology should technology remain concentrated and should the relationship between even the some concentrated uh, technology owners with the users of that technology and when we are saying users and i think there was one question here about not only just consumers it is about also business users because if that relationship needs to be managed and i think uh, that that's the area where the regulations and regulators should be looking at thank you um carl i can bring in bring you in here um so looking looking at kind of global trends right do you think big tech dominance is here to stay and what might shake that up or what might change it um one of the one of the when we when we'd exchange notes over email, one of the points that you had mentioned was around the availability of data, right? Could uh, to, could a decline in the availability of high quality data end up Im impacting big tech dominance? And it that that really struck with me because I I saw a tweet by Sam Altman the other day where he mentioned that by in X number of years the amount of uh, chat GPT generated data on the internet would be more than uh, non chat GPT generated data on the internet, and that that raises a real question. Question, right about the quality of that data because we know that the data that the the outputs from a chat gpt kind of uh, application are not uh, there's a there's a lot of hallucination there's a lot of error so and so forth so i'm curious to hear your perspective on what you think would challenge uh, the dominance of big tech and what does that mean for the future of ai yeah i think it's important to know that we don't actually know how this technology is going to develop over the next couple of years and it is sadly true that we have these scaling laws whereby bigger data sets more compute tends to lead to better performance in a variety of tasks but these scaling laws are not laws of physics they are empirical uh, empirical regularities and uh, they're also underpinned by technological advances like the transformer um, for um, example. Um, and I think there are good reasons to believe that these patterns may not continue. First of all, there are many that believe that Moore's law is likely to peter out in the next couple of years, uh, simply due to physical constraints. Uh, secondly, these models have already been trained on basically the bulk of the internet, although we don't know exactly what data they have been trained on. Uh, it is important um, to note, uh, but the internet is not going to grow by orders of magnitude uh, in the coming years. And in fact, if it does, it's likely to be because it's going to be flooded by uh, generative uh, AI produced um, data. And so to alleviate some of these bottlenecks, companies are increasingly starting to train on video and, and other sources, but you're going to run into uh, bottlenecks there quite quickly as well. So what I suspect will be needed going forward is innovation that is data saving um, and not to differently from the steam age, frankly, where James Watt's separate condenser was really what made the technology viable because it economized on the use of coal. We are going to need a separate condenser mo moment in artificial intelligence um, as well. Um, and I think when we look at the models that we do currently have, as you mentioned, they hallucinate. And we often, you know, when we apply them to new tasks, new circumstances, we don't know if what the model uh, is has been trained on actually uh, functions well 
when new circumstances um, emerge. So if you take Go, for example, uh, there was a huge milestone a couple of years ago uh, with AlphaGo outperforming uh, Lisa Do. And uh, last year, actually, humans made an astounding combat, uh, comeback uh, because uh, it was uh, noticed that actually uh, AlphaGo doesn't understand basic concepts in Go and humans with help of computers um, actually uh, managed to beat it quite easily. So um, going forward, it's important to remember it's early days. We will probably need more innovation uh, going forward to uh, have models that are more robust and better to uh, capable of learning uh, from smaller expert curated um, data sets. Um, and it is by no means clear who's going to drive that innovation, whether it's going to be big technology firms or whether it's going to be startups or whether it's going to be both. I'll stop um, there. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. You've also done a lot of work uh, looking at the labor question, right? What the impact of uh, emerging technologies, automation, AI would be on the labor force in terms of job displacement, job creation, so on and so forth. Um, and I know you've been watching this space for a while. Have any of your views on this changed as uh, as the kind of AI moment has become bigger and bigger and it's clear that um, this is going to be the, like Pramod was saying, the key kind of technology of our time from when you started looking at this space, let's say five, seven, ten years ago? So when we started uh, looking at this around a decade ago, we concluded that it's primarily a low skill, low income job that are most exposed to AI uh, going forward. And what we did at the time is sort of trying to figure out which jobs that are likely to disappear entirely. So not sort of looking at the task composition and of those occupations. And um, what we see with generative AI is that it's more skilled jobs that are exposed, but exposure in this case doesn't mostly mean full automation. Um, and in most cases, you still need a human for prompting, uh, you still need a human for fact checking, you still need a human to select and edit the output. And because technologies like ChatGPT uh, are very good at performing basically average, maybe slightly above average content, uh, almost by design because it's trained on the bulk of the internet, um, it tends to help people more that are on the lower end of the skill uh, distribution. So uh, generative AI in that regard has the potential to actually level the playing field. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to remember that that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody uh, will benefit because very similar to Uber in taxi service, for example, what it does, it reduces barriers to entry into content creation that is likely to uh, lead to more competition. And unless we consume a lot more content as a consequence of that, uh, that might mean wage pressures for certain groups um, in the labor market. And one way of thinking about it is how much more Netflix would you watch if the subscription rate was lower and the content was a lot better? And I suspect not that much because your time is limited uh, just like mine. So it's, it's likely that uh, quite a few content creators are going to be squeezed as a, conse a consequence. But overall, I think we can be quite optimistic about uh, some of the effects chat GPT and other generative AI technologies will have on the labor market. At the same time, though, it's important to remember that all of the AI is not generative AI. And uh, developments in autonomous vehicles and other technologies may have very different effects. No, for sure. And thanks for that. I think it's also important to remember that, you know, the ones who lose the jobs may not be necessarily the same ones who are getting reskilled and getting the jobs. And there's also a generational issue that I think we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about that job displacement. Uh, but Pramod, you wanted to come in on the jobs issue. Yes, I think so. Um, and, and, and I really appreciate Carl's views on this. <laughs> because, again, like most technologies, the first thing everybody wants to do is scare the shit out of everyone else. All right. 
This happened when computers were introduced, all jobs would be lost. All this would happen. When e-commerce came in, all real estate would be gone. All buildings would finish. All the, this is, you know, we can, we know this history and we repeat it, right? The fact is, most technologies, there is some displacement, of course. But most technologies have created more jobs. This is history. You can look at it, any economic history you look at. When Uber came in, everybody, and in emerging economies, actually, it'll create even more jobs because in an emerging economy, it makes the market expand much more than it might in a very developed economy where an Uber takes over jobs from an existing taxi. In India, we've got 10, 15, 20,000 more drivers occupied because of Uber. Similarly, if you look at health tech, the examples I gave you, all of them will be additional jobs. They're not going to be displacing jobs. They're going to fill a massive need, which emerging economies have because they're poor. And I think that's where I wish the dialogue again could be changed to say, yes, of course, there will be some places where it will be hurt. Um, and frankly, it will be in the professions. You know, you don't need, I don't need a lawyer doing contracts for me now. I can go quickly and get it done. But then my lawyer will spend more time giving me more advice and better advice on other things that are more important. You don't need researchers. I mean, one of the topics I should talk about here is as a career, right? Researchers, how much time do we spend on collecting basic data and then making sense of it? As opposed to here, you've got the data, now you spend the bulk of your time making sense of it. What a massive increase in productivity as opposed to saying, oh dear, that work is gone. So I think these are, and history has proven this time and time again. And I think it improves the quality of the work that can actually be done. In fact, there was a great statement made, which I heard a long time ago, which I really love, that AI will bring humanity into jobs. It's going to make you do your, it's going to make your job better because it'll take away some of the grunge work you may have otherwise had to do. But the broad theme I would say is, no, new technology, especially in emerging economies, will create more jobs. And yes, there will be some displacement, which we should help and manage. But by far, it will create many more jobs than it will take away. I think your comments actually remind me that more than anything else, we need research uh, more than ever before to actually have the evidence uh, to build or support these arguments. Because... We've also seen an increase in inequality over the since we've seen an increase in technological innovation. And I think there was a recent OECD report that said that we have seen an increase in productivity in the first 10 years of digitalization, but we're yet to get the numbers to show an increase in productivity over the past five, six years. So it could be a catch up issue, but it could also be a question that we just need the data, we need the evidence. But I still think it's, a, it's an open question on whether it's called technological innovation has contributed to more inequality or more equality or more jobs. And obviously the answer is not the same for uh, everywhere. I think what is not an open question, I'm afraid, is that technology has created more jobs. Very simple. So we can argue the nuances, of course, and that's correct. <laughs> but technology, I mean, 25% of all major employment in this country over the last 10 years was created by the IT industry. 25%, right? Big numbers. All of them have created more jobs. Yes, within it, there are issues on gender, issues on diversity, issues on balance, issues on proprietoriness, issues that need to be regulated. But I don't think we should lose sight of the big picture here. Yeah. And that has My that they've created more. Need more research. That was that was the only. Well, point. yeah. Except but, let, let's just acknowledge that it's created more jobs. Please, that's fact. That's research. That's done. Okay. Uh, Pail, thank you. Would either of you like to come in on this question on jobs and productivity? I have just been uh, trained recently by Michael Spencer's lecture, where he did mention that uh, there haven't been much productivity increases. And so that, again, is an empirical question for India, whether we should do uh, uh, empirical exercise and declare, but perhaps we can, we can, we can do that. Uh, jobs, there would be displacements, like any technological cycles. Uh, some jobs would be displaced, but some new jobs would be created. So I think what one should worry about, whether it was the US or it is India, it is not about, uh, it is about a redistribution of jobs, redistribution of jobs across uh, various skill categories. And so what one should worry about is reskilling uh, of, of 
for labor rather than being worried about displacement of uh, labor. And again, in skilling, I don't think we have yet done a good job with it. We need to do a better job when it comes to reskilling. The US economy did a very bad job and that's exactly why they are facing such polarized uh, uh, de debates in the in the in, in their polity uh, because of the loss of jobs and people who lost jobs who were the losers uh, now are able to uh, um, call the shots uh, and so India should not go through that mistake and we should and again one more thing when we were talking about contestability competition and that point uh, and that goes with for this also when it comes to new technology from the labor side there has to be some public policy rules and not, and i'm not talking about now regulation so dpis for instance can also in, infuse not only uh, uh, access but can infuse competition and contestability so what dpi what ondc or what a upi has upi has been doing done to fintech and ondc is supposedly to be doing to e-commerce similarly when it comes to the labor question the policy maker has to be and and that's a part of the entire regulatory architecture so when we are talking about regulation, we are also talking about promotion of an ecosystem that is fair and contestable, and uh, and skilling would be one element of that. I think on jobs, let me just quickly jump in. Uh, you know, almost a decade ago, when I was working with an MNC, uh, they used AI and machine learning to such an extent that. Uh, there was a team of 800 people that was doing a bunch of work and there was a plan to increase that to 4,800 people. But the machine learning algorithms became so good that this huge space that was hired for 4,000 people was never occupied. You know, the same 800 people were doing the work that was estimated for 4,800 people. So I think what is different this time is that uh, displacement has come for white collar jobs, which is, you know, which we have never seen that before. Uh, at the same time, when it comes to jobs, I think we have to start looking at areas which will be relatively insulated from displacement by AI. If that means that at a national level, we have to aggressively look at areas like, let's say, tourism, which are which may not be that affected by AI. I think those are the kind of things that we need to look at from a policy perspective. Care work might be another area that is potentially not as impacted by AI, uh, which is something that we desperately need more of in this country. So yeah, I think you're right that we need to look at those spaces which may not, which be less impacted and how do we grow those. Um, I want... Yeah. Well, well, quickly, Mike Spence said it well. He said there's an assumption in these discussion that like software coding, the market will be stationary. So anybody comes in, that'll be loss of job, nothing else will happen. The market is expanding. So I think we should focus on how will AI expand, which markets, and therefore, how will that also create your... That has to come together. That's... Um, I wanted to open it up for Q&A now. Uh, I see one hand over there, another there. Okay, let's take these two questions, and then we'll come back to the audience. Uh, I'm Sumit. I'm a founding director of the Center for Computational Economics. My question is plain that what should be the uh, approach taken by a competition authority to regulate competition in the market of AI? Uh, the I mean, the traditional debate is the ex-ante versus the ex-post approach. But I think what Ms. Malik just suggested, what FTC is doing, I think that it's neither ex-ante nor ex-post because a fact has already taken place in terms of an investment has already happened. However, the effect is still in the making. So are we suggesting that the regulator should uh, closely follow the developers of the market? One. Second, I also want to agitate the question of what exactly is open in open source technology. Is it the access to data? Uh, is it the algorithm? Uh, is it access to foundation model? Or is it the technical expertise? Or the CPUs or GPUs or so on and so forth? Uh, my question is also rooted in a paper written by one of the fellows based out of Carnegie Mellon University, where they specifically pointed out that this whole discussion of open source AI only comes when it comes about regulating AI. Uh, and this is a strategically used by corporations to entrench their dominance in the markets. So that's one. And lastly, I would also like to express agreement with what Mr. Basina said, that absolutely, I think when we talk about South Asian countries, the development, the perspective has to be different because we have a lot to gain from big tech versus we lose. 
uh, and this has to be contextualized because developed countries has already gained a lot. But in India, there's a lot of outreach which is yet to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great questions, I think. I think maybe Patti, you want to take the first one on competition and Venki, maybe I can turn to you for the open source. Open source, yeah. Uh, so it's it's nothing new. It's a new wine and old bottle. So the way it has started to pan out when it comes to, as I said, the relationship between the platform and the complementers. And so it is all about how the competition authorities look at this ecosystem. So they know the playbook. So it's not that they have to uh, uh, up the ante so much or, or change, change gears totally when it comes to this technology. Uh, so that's and 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 they have learned a lot. There's a lot of learned behavior now with the regulators to be able to uh, catch trends quicker than they were able to do with Web 2.0. And uh, many competition authorities have have started acting uh, on 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 that. And I I also uh, regarding uh, your uh, point, I am also of a firm believer we need not cut copy paste regulatory. Uh, regimes from the developed countries. We need to see how it best serves uh, uh, the uh, our ecosystem and especially the relationship and uh, uh, taking out the synergies between the startups and the big tech. It, it is not an adversarial relationship. So it is not about pegging one against the other. It is about drawing out the synergies. And on just open source, uh, uh, well said, as I said, we, we saw it in the mobile system, open source, comes with caveats. So one has to be very careful. What does an open source lead to? Does it lead to uh, more advantage for the technology, which is open source? Though early trends in AI says that in some sense, it is more open than the open source, which we are aware because there are small data sets, small uh, 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 researchers and academicians who are using these uh, open AI technologies to uh, develop uh, products and uh, services. Uh, but we have to get into the minutiae about what is open and whether or not that open source is leading to uh, benefits flowing back to the open source uh, providers. I think Payal's points are a perfect segue for my uh, points. The thing is that I think there is a lot of open washing that is going around. I think the people who have half open items and they are calling it open source, I, we need to understand fundamentally that any open source license is a license that you know does not have any restrictions on redistribution, uh, collaboration, uh, and you know, and this authorized by the open source initiative. So if if one of the OSI licenses approved licenses is not applied to the software, it is not open source. I think there is massive massive amounts of misinformation around this particular point, and it's important to clear that up. Uh, I think another point from a competition perspective will be. The fact that in India, we see a lot of patenting of AI, despite the fact that the section 3K of the Indian Patents Act saying that mathematics, business methods, computer programs per se, and algorithms cannot be patented. Patents on AI are all patents on algorithms. And what could likely happen is that it requires tremendous business sophistication to file patents. So we could see that you know large companies file a whole thicket of patents such that a small company will not be able to enter. And you know, you will have three, four big companies saying that we sign cross-licensing agreement amongst ourselves and the startups are then excluded from that particular area. So I think these are, from a competition perspective, these are some of the challenges that I see coming up in the next few days. And I think I it's going to lead to a lot of litigation. So let me just stop there. Can I just ask you a small clarificatory question, just picking up on the question from the audience. Are there any... Is there an issue with applying the open source label in the context of AI? Because AI is obviously not traditional kind of software, right? So is there something that we need to be cautious of as we use the term open source in the context of AI in, in the level of the model, at least? So uh, I think the open source initiative wrote to Meta saying that asking them to stop using the term open source when it came to Llama. And uh, I think this is a very valid point, you know, because unless you have unrestricted rights to redistribute the software, you should not be calling it open source. And it should be one of the OSI approved licenses that is applied to the software. Uh, so yeah, there is a bit of, you know, what is called truthification of uh, open source in these uh, areas. So even data sets, you know, if there is restrictions on 
redistribution and usage of that data set, then it cannot be open source in the true sense because the three pillars of open source are collaboration, community, and the shared ownership of knowledge. Let yeah, me stop. Just, just a small point in, on that because there's a hierarchy also when it comes to open source. What is what? What are you giving in that open source license is also important. Uh, and in fact, there is uh, again FTC is uh, looking at the agreement between Microsoft and OpenAI, uh, whether or not there is some kind of uh, exclusivity or a self-referencing agreement between open source uh, between OpenAI and Microsoft when it comes to open source license, where model weights are being given to Microsoft but not to other users of OpenAI. So it is creating again some kind of uh, uh, self-referencing issues, uh, and so therefore it you need to get into, so these are these are highly complex issues and you need to get into the agreements. Uh, by and large, open source, uh, as, 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 as I think Menki mentioned, the Lama is, uh, has been questioned for calling it, uh, itself as open source. Uh, by and large, open source is just limited to a API. That is the uh, uh, application most cases, yeah. uh, In and, most cases, open and no, source. No more than that, no yeah. training data, no, no model parameters. Uh, and of course, no, um, None of the other things. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the case with most claims to be open source these days. It's actually just an open API. Uh, there was a question here. Yes, sir. And we'll take one more after that. So if you, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Pramod Bhaseen. I think I need not remind you, BRICS, BRICS happened because of young population. They were part of the BRICS. It happened and many prime ministers lost their job also. And elderly people in UK, wanted to be part of the, yeah. Right. So we should not forget, this is also a very living example. And we claim our population is a dividend. Until unless we have a very skilled or a properly educated educated population, it may be register. It may be harmful for our society also. So we have to make our education in such a way they are contributing in the society rather than their liability. Should we take I, I, one more question and club it just for the interest of time? Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Vatul. I work at the Center for WTO Studies. Uh, my question is for Carl. Uh, there have been recent observations that uh, AI-generated content, uh, when it is used to train uh, uh, new AI models, it uh, tends to result in garbage outputs. So at least for the present, uh, it does appear that uh, human-generated content is required for training models. So do you see a future where big tech in developed countries uses cheap labor from the global south to train their models and uh, if that happens what do you think will be the economic consequences of that thank you come on you want to come respond and then carl I'll, I'll respond to the first one and let carl respond actually the issue of skilling is a huge issue we desperately need it in our country we desperately need education at a better level more teachers more tutors more mentors one of the things that i think ai will do is actually achieve that it'll help us achieve that that's why I think it's so powerful, is because it will actually allow us to train the poorest student the best, allow us to reach out to people who otherwise couldn't get to a school, allow us to provide curriculum of a different nature and a different type to people, to understand who's learning best, who's not learning best. So I think that's why, in fact, it's a fundamental issue, it's a huge issue, and I hope that this is one technology which can really help solve for it. Thank you. Carl, over to you. It was not an easy question, but I think it's a very good question that came from the audience. So, so when it comes to uh, AI, genera AI generated content for training data, so I think it's true that uh, that has uh, been demonstrated uh, to lead to model failure. Um, I think there are some promising approaches that uh, use synthetic data, but every time you use synthetic data, you also have to ask yourself, how well does the uh, environment uh, that you simulate actually reflect the real uh, environment? Um, and I think um, going forward, we will probably see some application where synthetic data can be very useful, uh, but I don't think that's the majority uh, of cases. And if you look at, for example, technologies like AlphaFold, it relied on synthetic data as well, but it also depended on having a very large uh, training data set uh, to begin with, which is supplemented. Um, on the question of uh, training data being developed in the global south, I think to some degree we're already seeing that, uh, at least when it comes to um, 
uh, reinforcement learning through uh, human feedback uh, in particular. OpenAI uh, has been using labor from the global south uh, to that um, end. Uh, and I think that this is a practice that is likely to continue. Yeah, I think, I mean, whether it's for the training data or even the labeling of data, so on and so forth, I mean, that whole industry is uh, is in the global south, whether it's in places like India, Kenya, so on and so forth. Um, I think we've run out of time, uh, but thank you all for uh, participating in this conversation. I think we could have talked for many, many hours. I'm not going to try and sum up the conversation, but I think the the big takeaway from me or the big question for me is that how does India leverage this AI opportunity without reproducing some of the harms that we know are entailed in the production of AI systems, whether it's the concentration of power or the exploitation of labor or the environmental harms that we haven't uh, discussed today. So that's no small challenge, but we have a very hopeful panelist. So uh, hopefully all is good. Thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Carl and uh, Venki, if they can stay, we'll get a picture with them on the screen if that's fine. Yeah. yeah uh, no, you can stand, stand. I, uh, I think the screen is higher up. So, Carl and Venki, please stay on for two minutes. And also, this is uh, very congenial. I wasn't. <laughs> so, we're productive ones. <laughs> Yeah, I think Wenki is getting covered. Oh, like oh, oh, oh. Here we go. But, uh, All right, come back, sir. Oh, Nate, I, I don't it's think the picture has. Uh, Remember, this side. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we uh, sort of start our last panel, I just wanted to remind that when we started the day, uh, I spoke about this QR code at the back of your notebook. Uh, I'd request you to actually look at it again. Uh, it is to submit feedback for our report. Uh, we'll we'll use it. So please do find time and we, we are very serious about actually working harder on site 2025. So do find time and fill that feedback. Now uh, to the last and most important session, uh, even while we were putting together the site report, I think what came across with India's rapid digitalization was this worry about protecting the internet and all the problems related to cybersecurity. So uh, this is a very important and serious uh, discussion. And I'm uh, pleased to invite our panelists for this last session. Uh, it's going to be chaired by uh, August. He's the World Bank Country Director for India. August, so thank you so much for joining. And we have uh, Mr. Narendra Nath, Joint Secretary, National Security Council, uh, Government of India, as one of the panelists. Vinaya Godse, CEO of DSCI. Payal Arora, she is professor of inclusive AI cultures and co-founder of FemLab. And Ms. Nafi Naik, who is a senior advocate with the Supreme Court and also founder of Cyber Sati. But I think she hasn't been able to join yet. Uh, she, she did warn me that she might get stuck in the court. So if she's available, she'll join. Otherwise, we can get started. Yeah.